Betty Aldworth, executive director of SSDP. She takes us through what she's doing with that organization, how much it's grown, and uh, the important work that they're doing right now. You've certainly heard her name before on uh, other episodes of uh, this very podcast. So uh, she takes us through her important work on uh, Amendment 64 as well as uh, her timeline. Okay, so we do have Betty Aldworth. Betty, thanks so much for uh, giving us some time. Seth, I'm so excited to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, and uh, we are documenting a oral history of legal cannabis in real time. And uh, as that is our mission, I'm sure you can imagine your name has come up a few times. Well, I couldn't have been any luckier than to uh, been tapped to carry the voice um, of the Amendment 64 campaign in Colorado uh, as the uh, one of the spokespeople and then also as advocacy director heading up the grassroots there. So um, having been so engaged in that first uh, in the campaign that, that made Colorado the first state uh, to regulate cannabis uh, in the modern era is pretty exciting. Absolutely. And, you know, we want to kind of uh, make sure that we talk about everything. But as far as spokesperson, as far as advocacy director, you know, how did you become connected to Mason and Steve and, you know, Brian and everybody that was involved there? So I had been doing uh, medical marijuana advocacy in Colorado for a handful of years before 2012. I started in that realm in 2009 after spending a decade working in um, the the mainstream nonprofit world in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And, um, but had long, you know, agreed that obviously marijuana should be regulated for adults. Right. When I uh, began, or when when I was uh, doing that that work, uh, the medical marijuana work, I got to know Mason and Brian, and as I uh, became an advocate for sensible drug policy, I got to know them a bit better. And uh, so in 2012, when they were looking for an, uh, someone to uh, talk to women specifically about cannabis, uh, I was fortunate enough mm. to be in the right place with the right knowledge. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Coloradans for Medical Marijuana Regulation, that's the group that you uh, are speaking about when you're, uh, when, when we're talking about well, this, Well, I've yes? been doing consulting for some period of time with a handful of different folks in the medical marijuana space, and one of those pieces of work that I did was to try to um, fix Coloradans for Medical Marijuana Regulation uh, <laughs> after some, some tumultuous early years. Man, that goes back. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a while ago. Um, but I had been doing uh, sort of generally um, work in the space of medical marijuana policy, community relations, public relations, um, advocacy, that kind of thing. Really trying to help bring a, um, a, a to, to open up the, the burgeoning medical marijuana industry to people who had never thought about it before. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm really mm. passionate about in this space is uh, introducing people who have never thought about medical cannabis as an option to the notion that it might help them either for their serious illnesses, but even also for, you know, general wellness. That's a very exciting realm for me. Uh, so I was doing that kind of work. Uh, and Coloradans for Medical Marijuana Regulation was, yes, uh, one of the things that I did in that time. Okay. Well, let's let's understand how and why this is a passion. Let's. Uh, what we would love to do is try to figure out where that uh, kind of concept or thought process uh, germinated uh, or was generated. So, so where are you from originally? I was born in Chicago, raised in Southern uh -huh. Nevada, lived in California for a couple of years. And then when I was 19, I moved to Colorado and stayed for a very long time. 
Uh huh. <laughs> okay, so uh, kind of dotted the map to uh, Colorado. Fair enough. How long were you in Chica- uh, Chicago? For? Oh, I was born there, and we moved when I was like four or five. My parents couldn't take the snow anymore. Got it. And do you remember oh, Chicago of course, or no? Of course, yeah. I even have family yeah. in the cannabis industry in Chicago, and I'm very excited that we are finally going to start to see some movement on. Uh, safe access for medical cannabis for people in Illinois. Okay. I'm, you said I'm really excited. We've uh, spoken with uh, Tim McGraw, one of the producers there, and uh, it sounds like uh, we're close to, to having something happen, uh, you know, as far as product is concerned uh, in the, over the next couple of months. Is that is that what you uh, what you know based on having family there? That's, uh, well, my family is in, uh, on the, the, on the uh, lighting side, but the um, from what I'm seeing uh, b- based on news reports and talking to others who are doing work in the cultivation and retail space, that's my understanding. In just a few months, yeah. uh, Illinoisans will have actual medical cannabis uh, produced uh, and available for sale, which is such an exciting thing. Uh, I think that as we bring these uh, regulated markets to more and more states, uh, not only are we going to be helping millions of patients, uh, but we're also going to be really moving the conversation forward on uh, regulation of of cannabis broadly, um, as well as, you know, creating, I think, a healthier society. Yeah. And, you know... As more patients gain access, the, you know, we can't help but prove the point, I guess, is, is, is what you're saying there. Sure. Right. So there's this, you know, there, there's this something that happens, I think, in the minds of people, of, of voters, when you are exposing them to this idea that, hey, cannabis can be regulated safely for adult or for medical use. Um, they can't help but think, hang on, we also can regulate all of these other things for any number of different uses. Uses. Why are we locking people up for using, you know, for this one particular item um, that is, you know, it, it's all the, the same old things that, that we yeah. we know so well. It's safer than alcohol. Um, you know, it, it it's a waste of government resources. And all of those things really come, all of those ideas really get crystallized in the mind of the voter when they are yeah. seeing cannabis businesses behaving responsibly, transparently, and ethically in their own community. Absolutely. And so if we're tracking uh, your timeline and, and your route, uh, you said you were born in Chicago, spent four or five years there. Your uh, movements tie in nicely with what's happening in the industry now because you go from Chicago to Nevada that's, uh, in your life Nevada, at age five, so. right? Uh, it's Nevada. What's that? Not Nevada. Ah, <laughs> uh, Yes. No, I've, I, I, so I, it doesn't, um, that's one of those things that I still need to learn. Uh, I know that uh, New Orleans is New Orleans, not New Orleans, for instance. Uh, but uh, Nevada, uh, Nevada, it, it won't go in for some reason. You know what I mean? I, I, I it's like vase and vase for me. As, as long but, as you're okay uh, Nevada, with getting, right? with getting that's what you corrected want me to every say. time you say it and you're talking to a Nevada and that's just, <laughs> that's just fine. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I I want to say it correctly. It it just it. Uh, I don't know. That's the one that won't go in for some reason. But Nevada, mm-hmm, I think Nevada. is right. Right. Okay, good. Nevada. Okay. So uh, we're in, in Nevada. City, Nevada. Nevada. Uh, and in fact, uh, the the drafter of the Nevada legislation uh, is a close family friend of ours. So Senator Tick Sagerbloom um, has been. Uh, an incredible advocate for sensible drug policy reform in Nevada, both in terms of medical marijuana as a supporter of adult of marijuana for adult use and looking at some of the ways that we can approach other drug use um, in a more humane and uh, science-based, uh, compassionate ma- uh, manner. 
Absolutely. Tick uh, was at the same event that you were at in uh, August of uh, last year. I'm uh, sure you remember. I didn't know that he was a family friend. He is. Yep. And I'm so pleased with the the way that Nevada is coming along uh, in terms of developing a, a safe access methods for patients there. Unfortunately, it was a little too late for my grandmother who passed of ovarian cancer. When I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Thank you. Um, when Nevada still was a total mess in terms of their medical marijuana program. So many people don't know that Nevada was one of the early states to come along with a solid medical marijuana program. But because the access wasn't there through regulated markets, it was tremendously difficult for people to uh, access that marijuana, the medical marijuana. And, you know, when it came to my grandmother's care, uh, my mother was baking cookies in her kitchen, and my mother's never used cannabis in her life. So it's, you know, it's a really challenging um, setup when there isn't that regulated market, as we all know. Uh, so Nevada's coming along. We should see stores open there very soon, Illinois. And, of course, I'm lucky enough to live in two of the five places in the U.S. where marijuana is legal for adult use. Mm -hmm. And you're speaking of, uh, uh, of Colorado, of course. Mm -hmm. Colorado, where my honey and my cats are, and <laughs> Washington, D.C., where my team and my office is. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure to uh, to talk more uh, about your history. But in terms of D.C., what is happening on the ground in terms of legal, uh, you know, use? Sure. So, you know, the Congress has been in a tizzy over what's happening in D.C. since the initiative passed practically. Representative Andy Harris out of Maryland has made it his personal vendetta to make sure that we can't uh, enact legislation that or this initiative that vo the voters so clearly wanted. I mean, adult use marijuana legalization passed by 70% in DC. There is no question that DCists want this. Uh, so, Mr. Harris has uh, tried to block, along with a handful of others in Congress, our ability to enact Initiative 71 and if any further legislation. Fortunately, it looks like um, you know the the ability to enact Initiative 71 is not in the hands of Congress, um, mm. or at least they weren't able to act quickly enough. So, for all intents and purposes, and in the the current interpretation. Uh, marijuana is legal for adult use here in D.C. They all have been able to block the district council from uh, whose budget they control in many ways, Congress controls in many ways, from figuring out how to place a regulated market and do licensing for stores. This is, of course, deeply problematic um, in terms of, you know, our D.C.'s um, ability to respond to the will of the voters. So you've got, you know, the the statists here, the, the I shouldn't call them statists, the people who uh, argue for statehood, the uh -huh. statehoodists <laughs> um, here are, uh, you know, standing alongside uh, the cannabis uh, advocacy community to try to ensure we can enact this law. And then, you know, additionally, um, we have some really deep problems in the regulated medical marijuana market here, too. You know, when a patient goes to a store here in D.C., they are generally able to buy a handful of grams of medical cannabis, which for many patients might be, you know, a single, just a few days supply. There's no infused products. There's no concentrates to speak of because the supply is so limited. And these are this is, has nothing to do with market forces. This is entirely about really deep artificial uh, uh, restrictions on uh, the cultivator's ability to grow. Mm -hmm. And it's driving up prices. It's making access tremendously difficult for very sick people. And even though we were having access trouble before, thankfully the DC um, uh, DC opened up the conditions list to serve people living with any condition. I don't know, maybe about 18 months ago, 
But at the same time, we still have this huge access problem, and it's just getting worse. So that needs to be the first thing we fix here in D.C. Mm -hmm. And how can that be fixed? Uh Simply raising the plant limits uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and licensing uh, all of the providers that we're able to license. I believe that the city is able to license 10 cultivators and has only licensed maybe three or four. That's really problematic. We need to get all of those cultivation sites up and running in order to provide medicine for these people who need it so desperately. Okay, and so there's obviously forces working against each other, but in terms of a timeline, uh, is it uh, is there a kind of clear timeline to you, or is it very uh, murky? Oh, it's incredibly murky. I don't think right. that there. I don't think that we're going to see. I mean, there are a handful of different ways that we might see stores in DC um, at some point. My best guess is that um, it will come. Uh, in a handful of years, probably after some litigation. Okay. This will, this will probably be a court decision. In a handful of, of years. Mm -hmm. So let's then uh, go back to your timeline and uh, where we left you was Boulder City, Nevada, right? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what? how many years did you spend there? Uh, I grew up there for my, uh, I lived there from four or five until I was 17. Uh -huh. We and call those your formative years, I think. My formative years, mm -hmm. yes. And then the rest of my formative years were spent in, on the Eastern Sierras in California. Uh, okay. Near a town called Bishop, uh -huh. uh, which is where I did uh, the beginning of my college work at a place called Deep Springs. What did you say? I, I did the beginning of my college work at a place called Deep Springs, which is also where I learned how to ride horses uh -huh. um, and push cattle, uh -huh. make butter and milk a cow. Uh, I did wildlife research and studied bats. Uh, wow. And yes, <laughs> on a college campus with 25 students in the middle of nowhere on a ranch. What? How did you, yes. well, let's, let, let's go back to, to uh, how, how did you find this Deep Springs place? My father is a chef, and he was the chef at Deep Springs, so mm -hmm. I went to live with him there and did some schooling. So, wow. you know, milking cows at 5 a.m. and reading Foucault by 9. <laughs> what a day. <laughs> what a day. <laughs> and, uh... Uh, what what did you take from that? Because that is really living off of the land. That is truly being as organic as possible. So wh what was your lesson learned there? Well, you know, having the opportunity to live on a ranch um, in this really unique community has served me in two distinct ways. One of them is that you know, anybody who knows me well enough to have uh, gotten a hairy eyeball from me for not recycling, which is a <laughs> lot of people, <laughs> uh, knows that I'm, I'm very much concerned about the environment. And that has really fed into my understanding of how the cannabis industry should be shaping up when it comes to energy use and how we're designing, you know, uh, uh, how we're designing this, this uh, system here. Um, sure. You know, I'm a strong and avid supporter of outdoor and greenhouse grows. I very much oppose the use of um, harsh pesticides and any other chemicals that are going to have a negative downstream impact, much less a negative impact on the, on the consumer and the, the workers. Uh, those kinds of things are, are of tremendous importance to me. Um, additionally, uh, it was, you know, it, when you're living on a ranch with 50 other people, um, 25 of whom are students, and uh, you are... Uh, having that kind of uh, community building experience, mm -hmm. there's something tremendously unique about that. And you identify, you know, Deep Springers identify each other um, in a way that is very similar to the way that SSDPers identify with each other. Mm -hmm. So even though I wasn't an SSDPer in college because it didn't exist then, um, I have been able to appreciate and and understand the ways that SSD peers connect with each other and um, kind of make myself a part of this community 
because of that um, that experience at Deep Springs. Absolutely. And uh, SSDP is what you're doing in uh, D.C., and we are going to get to that. And when you say SSDPers, uh, uh, you know, uh, relate to each other the way that you uh, do. So it's a special type of thing when you get in the room with Chris Crane, I would imagine. Th things like that is what you're saying. Oh, no question. No question. Uh, you know, sure. folks like Troy Dayton, Chris Crane, Shay Gunther, Chris Latlakar, these people who are doing really interesting work. Uh, Shalene Title, oh my goodness, that woman. Uh, you know, the, the, these folks who are doing such interesting work at the at the forefront of this movement, mm -hmm. um, and who really understand that you know, in a, a visceral way, that movement, that, that the industry is part of this movement, um, and and is inextricably connected to it. Um, these folks are, I think. Um, you know, so many of them are SSDPers. So many of them came out of our network, and so many of them are um, carrying those values very strongly into the industry. I'm very grateful for that. But we also tell a lot of fun stories from the <laughs> early days. Well, uh, well, let's t let's uh, jump into SSDP. Let's get maybe even one of those stories if we can. Um, but you know. Before we go any further, what is going on right now? What is your mission as we speak? We're in June of 2015. You know, what is at the top of Betty Aldworth's executive director desk? Yeah, so uh, just a brief, a brief overview for those who aren't familiar with the organization. We are, um, the, we are the student movement to end the war on drugs. Um, so we have students on... To about 250 campuses, maybe four or five, 6,000 members who are all sharing these same values. The, the war on drugs is, is a failure. It is particularly a failure for youth, uh, who are precisely the people it purports to protect. And uh, youth need to rise up uh, with, you know, and, and rise their voice, raise their voices against these policies that they know don't serve them. So that happens in many different ways on these campuses. It might be that students are working specifically to uh, uh, end marijuana prohibition in their communities or, um, you know, end some of the unjust uh, laws affiliated with it. It might be that they are working for medical marijuana access or that they are working to implement harm reduction policies like Good Samaritan 911 programs. Uh, where if somebody is um, undergoing an overdose, experiencing an overdose because of drugs, including alcohol, they can call for help without fear of prosecution. You know, those, those few minutes where people debate um, are critically important, and Good Samaritan policies save thousands of lives every year. They might be working for access to naloxone, uh, which is an opioid overdose uh, reversal drug, um, also saving thousands of lives every year. Uh, access to clean needles so that we're not seeing transmission of um, infectious diseases among injection drug users. And all of the policies that go along with that, drug checking and safety in ven at, you know, nightlife venues, um, these are all the sorts of things that SSDPers care about. So they have the ability to decide what it is they want to be working on, um, and they are pushing for those policies about which they are most passionate on their campuses. And are you now getting an influx of uh, students that are familiar with you beforehand, whereas I think, you know, in Chris Crane's day, it was more of a, an upstart. Uh, do folks know to find SSDP on campus? Well, when you are, uh, you know, 1998, it, our founders uh, discovered each other through bulletin boards on the internet, you know, right. on the early internet. And that was a very, very different day. Um, now when you, uh, you know, you can, you can find us very easily when you Google, you know, students more on drugs. Um, yeah, and uh, it, it's, it, we certainly have a, a much stronger um, reputation and a strong reputation in the drug policy reform community. Uh, oftentimes students will find us um, you know, if, if we don't have a, a chapter on campus already, 
um, they might see their friends go through a traumatic experience related to uh, drugs themselves or, uh, you know, a, a, a collateral consequence, a harmful drug war policy. You know, uh, believe it or not, kids are actually getting evicted from housing and expelled from school for using marijuana. And so if that happens to them or one of their friends, uh, they are highly likely to want to do something about it. And mm -hmm. so they find us that way. Many students find us that way. And how many students of, are active with SSDP as we speak? Uh, we have about uh, 5,000 active members now. And we Excellent. are growing like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Excellent. And, you know, uh, I, I hate to uh, keep bringing up Chris Crane, but we did, uh, you know, an interview with him and he really talked about SSDP for a while, obviously, uh, due to his background. Um, and as far as, you know, what what he shared, it, it's such an important um, thing that you guys uh, are, are doing with the 5000 strong. Um, you know, well, he says, first off, that, that uh, basically when he tries to hire uh, folks, he, he's almost exclusively looking at, at SSDP uh, alum. Is that what you're hearing from other folks like Troy and other employers? Oh, sure, absolutely. Troy's got a handful of SSDPers on his team, including our uh, former board president, Michael Blunk. Uh, Chris has a lot of SSDPers on his team. I get inquiries all the time from cannabis industry entrepreneurs who... Uh, understand that SSDPers hold these incredibly strong values and ethics. Um, SSDPers are going to be interested in protecting a transparent, uh, responsible uh, cannabis industry, and they are, you know, they they get this industry movement relationship better than mm -hmm. anybody else, mm -hmm. um, and. As students go through the process of being an SSDP -er throughout college, it's not just that they're changing this work, uh, doing this work that is changing policy, they are also building extraordinary leadership skills. Right. I mean, folks like Troy Dayton and Chris Crane, and, and you can bring up Chris Crane all you want, he's one of my favorite people in the world. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> you know, uh, the, these these guys uh, were probably born leaders, but there's no question that their SSDP experience accelerated their ability to lead, uh, especially within this space. We're, mm -hmm. we're working on, you know, as these young people are figuring out how to navigate campus policy, state policy, local policy, whatever it might be, they're also learning how to organize people. They're learning how to... Uh, keep folks engaged. They're learning how to, you know, connect with students on campus, and the skills that they are learning in that time is making are making them the most desirable employees for the cannabis industry. Fortunately, yeah. a lot of the kids who are coming through our program, who who are SSD peers in college, are like I said, you know, they they're really interested in figuring out how they can continue their work on ending the drug war uh, after they graduate, there are a limited number of jobs, frankly, in drug policy reform, um, mm. but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs in the cannabis industry, and they are very excited, uh, some of them, to get engaged in that. Yeah, what what perfect timing for these, uh, for the students that are active now, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> and many of them, you know, again, the the, marijuana industry is riddled with SSD peers <laughs> at every, mm -hmm. from every, uh, every class. Um, right. but yes, for, well, especially let, for students let's, now. let's now go back to your, your timeline. And you did mention that you weren't an SSD peer in real time, uh, as, as a student. Um, <clears throat> well, and, uh, it now makes sense because you went to uh, school, uh, at least partly, uh, with only 24 other people or, or something like this, right? Yes. And that was in 1994. 95. Oh, so it wouldn't wouldn't be possible anyway. But uh, did you say that you went to another school besides? Oh, Deep sure. Springs? I've done a bunch of. Uh, when I moved to Denver, I uh, I, I went to uh, the University of Colorado at Denver and did some classes at uh, Metropolitan State College there as well. Uh -huh. um, I little known fact about Betty Aldworth, I did not have my bachelor's degree. Oh. Um, Work and life and changing the world were far too exciting, uh -huh. uh, so I I couldn't quite focus on the the on finishing that up. Um, 
as I was building my career as a volunteer uh, leadership professional, um, I, I wound up focusing more on that. And uh, as far as folks that uh, we've spoken to, even on this episode, uh, or ex- excuse me, spoken of, Tim McGraw also, uh, no, no bachelor's, no, no, uh, no college degree. Uh, so you're in good company, mm-hmm. certainly. So you are one of these people that uh, kind of can't sit still and kind of needs to get going. And so when did you realize that? So, you know, you, you kind of went to Deep Springs for a little bit and maybe you did some time at the at University of Colorado Denver, like you said. And um, but w- when did it kind of uh, occur to you that you needed to be doing as opposed to learning? Well, I've I've been uh, an activist and advocate since probably before I could walk. <laughs> I was raised in a household where um, participating in your community and uh, part- and and trying to change the world for the better was one of the core values of of our family. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to, you know, at every Easter after hunting for Easter eggs, we would go out to the Nevada test site for the annual protest, uh, the the annual anti nuke protest. Um, I organized my first action when I was 13. No, it it was turned out to be me and my mom doing trash pickup down by the lake because nobody else showed up. <laughs> but regardless, I tried to organize my first action when I was 13. <laughs> These are things that you know, changing the world has always been um, in whatever ways I can, you know, in small ways or, or big ways. Um, has always been tremendously important to yeah. me. You know, Kershey Koja and I uh, have reminisced fondly because we both were doing anti-apartheid uh, demonstrations and actions uh, back in the, the mid 90s. Um, and so there are that that has never been a surprise to me. We Aldworths are people who are very much engaged um, and who are uh, working hard to, to do something. So my inability to sit still um, is probably born a little bit out of that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I was doing uh, professional volunteer leadership, uh, it it was so compelling to have the opportunity to talk to people, uh, figure out what drove them, and then help them maximize their impact. Uh, and and that again is something that's very similar to the work that we're doing here at SSDP. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you you brought up your your folks though. I want to make sure to to talk about uh, this. You, you said that your dad was a chef, but then also kind of an activist. Um, you know, t- tell us a little bit more about him and uh, how he instilled the kind of the values and and your mother, of course, as well. But let's do your dad first. Uh, instilled the values that that you've got. What. Uh, was he a chef full time and uh, an activist part time, or you know, what what was his deal? Yep. So my dad uh, was and is a hippie, um, and uh-huh. and <laughs> has been you know protesting since the the mid sixties, I suppose, or started to do you know protesting then, and um, still is very much engaged in um, raising his voice against injustice um, and in. Um, and has been tremendously supportive of the work that we do. Uh, he was a chef, um, but is uh, uh, on disability now. He has a variety of different um, spinal conditions um, and is unable to work at this time. But he is very much um, active and engaged in uh, in discussion in his community and uh, around injustice and and. Uh, he's also, you know, a gardener and uh, makes some, his his wonderful wife, my stepmom, Jill, makes some great jams uh, from his orchard. And so he's, uh, you know, living uh, a fairly responsible, environmentally, environmentally responsible life uh, on the Eastern Sierras in California near where he was chefing at the time. Got it. I'm really lucky, though. I am surrounded by chefs. You are. Okay. How so? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, my honey, my dad, and my sister are all chefs. Okay. So I, yep. And uh, your honey that you that you speak of, what, what, t- let us know more about this person who you've who you've referred to as honey <laughs> twice. Oh, Jason, he's wonderful. Uh, he is. Uh, we met when we were both working at uh, one of the nonprofit organizations where he was a chef feeding people living with life threatening illnesses 
his job was to figure out how to um, uh, feed people with hundreds of different combinations of dietary restrictions. So he's really familiar with how to feed sick folk and uh, has been tremendously useful, I right. think, in um, helping me understand what's important for patients uh, who are, especially those who are consuming medical marijuana edibles. He's now working in uh, Denver for a nonprofit organization that is a drop-in day shelter uh, for women and children who are experiencing poverty and homelessness. And I'm tremendously proud of him. He's got the biggest heart of anybody I know. And then, of course, I was also shaped a great deal by uh, the, the women in my life. Um, my mom and grandma uh, were some of the fiercest. My mother is, uh, is still <laughs> one of the fiercest um, women I know. And she taught me a tenacity that without which I certainly wouldn't be here today. Mm. Um, her her she instilled in me a, a great understanding of uh, what it takes to hold on um, and keep moving and how incredibly important that is as a value how how so what it, let, let's go a level deeper there well you know she uh and my grandmother uh didn't have it particularly easy uh when it came to um you know navigating the world um, and their ability to um, keep standing uh, when they were taking some hits was was pretty amazing. Um, my, you know, in a very different time, my my grandfather, uh, when my mom graduated and her, her sister graduated from high school, um, he told them that they could, you know, move out or start paying rent. Uh, all the while, he was paying for college for my uncle. Um, you know, and that was, again, again, it was a different time. Um, but my mom and aunt turned out to be incredibly successful professionals, uh, even though they didn't have the same opportunities as their brother. And, and they turned that into something that really served them. Um, and they got really tough. So uh, that was something that I needed desperately uh, when things were hairy in Colorado, um, and and when things have been tough, uh, you know, as as we're navigating this medical marijuana space, and there was a time not very long ago that a lot of us remember well, especially Coloradans, but we see it in so many other states where um, everybody was just you know dug in with their fingernails, trying to hold on and make sure that we could navigate regulatory changes and all of these challenges that were that were threatening people's businesses and well-being so far beyond the fact that we were all engaging in federally illegal activity um, you know and, and mm. I, I've said many times it takes a very very special person to wake up in the morning and uh, you know, make a choice to make more, break more federal laws before breakfast than most people do all day or all their <laughs> right. entire, their or entire in a lives lifetime. rather. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, less so now the, the federal threat has really, um, uh, you know, it, it's not something that many people think about. Uh, yeah. the laws haven't changed at all, but certainly, uh, public opinion has, and, and it's probably safe ish to assume mm. that, you know, public opinion wouldn't allow for a crackdown on medical marijuana. Um, but one of the things that worries me about the way that the industry is taking shape right now is that people don't seem to really be thinking about the fact that they are, <laughs> there, there isn't that ever-present feeling of, uh, you know, acknowledgement um, that we are engaging in a federally illegal activity and that there is danger and that there are a lot of people sitting in prison for engaging in exactly the same behavior that we are now holding up and getting on the covers of magazines for. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, uh, as we go here, we'll, we'll tell more of those 
stories, but you did bring up, you know, through uh, your mother and grandmother instilling uh, in you, uh, you know, that that fighting spirit and uh, how uh, times did get, uh, you know, were tough in Colorado. Um, let's just go through the Amendment 64 uh, thing through your uh, perspective, because we have spoken to uh, a host of others. And, you know, I want to just make sure to dot the timeline uh, through Betty Aldworth's eyes. So, you know, you were uh, doing your community relations type things. Um, w- you know, wh- when did it, uh, when did you kind of start uh, personally getting involved Involved specifically with Amendment 64? Sure. So I joined the campaign team in February of 2012, maybe late January of 2012. So at that mm-hmm. point, the initiative had been drafted. Um, my very first press conference actually was when we uh, submitted the signatures uh, for, the, um, for the initiative. So mm-hmm. the um, you know, the, the initiative had been drafted, we had collected all the signatures, and we were confident that we were ready to go um, and that the initiative was going to be on the ballot. Um, that's when I became engaged as a staffer. Of course, I had been doing some volunteering and some uh, participation in other ways prior to that um, and had been working with Mason and Brian on a few other pieces. Um, you know, it, throughout the years before, but that's when I joined the staff of the campaign. Now, okay. here's something interesting. We went and did that press conference, we submitted the signatures, and then about mm, two weeks later, we got word that we hadn't qualified and we had to go get more signatures. Uh, so that was a little bit, uh, that was an interesting way to start a new job, that's for sure. Uh, t- tell us about that. What, what do you mean that you hadn't qualified? What happened there? There were a number of signatures that were invalid. And frankly, I can't remember if there was something specific. Anyhow, uh, you know, when you you submit signatures, uh, the industry standard is to submit at least half as many, but maybe two or three times as many um, as you need for a ballot initiative because a very large percentage of the signatures that you submit are not going to be valid. The Secretary of State mm-hmm. actually goes through and checks the individual signatures. Um, they randomly select some number, and it depends on the state. Um, they randomly select some number, they check the signatures, and if not a high enough percentage of the randomly selected signatures qualifies, such that you have met the threshold, um, then you have generally a cu- what's known as a cure period. During that cure period, you have the opportunity to um, go out, collect more signatures, and try to make sure that you meet the, the minimum threshold. So we had to use that cure period and had to collect, I don't know, maybe 60,000 more signatures um, just to make sure that there was going to be no question that the investment that we had all made in time and energy and, and work that we had done um, wasn't going to, to be for naught. Uh, so we collected many, many, many more signatures than we needed and turned them back in towards the end of February, at which point we were qualified for the ballot. Excellent. All right. So now, you know, it's already uh, February of 2012. Betty's been a part of this thing for a whole two months or so. <laughs> what, uh, uh, you know, take us through the rest of the year. What, uh, what were you doing and, uh, you know, how did you do it? Well, so we had really developed um, this idea. And, and Mason started on this in 2004 in Colorado or, two thousand yeah, 2000. Talking to people about the idea that marijuana is safer than alcohol Uh, and therefore we should be able to regulate it in a similar manner. In 2006, he had run that statewide campaign, uh, which really initiated the conversation in the state. And so it had been a long, ongoing conversation that Coloradans were really used to the idea that, hey, marijuana is in fact safer than alcohol, and we can regulate them in a similar manner. But there were still groups of people that we needed to reach out to, and there was still a lot of work to be done especially given that our opposition was so very strong. You know, in Washington, they had a a far more institutional support than we did 
for their initiative. They had elected officials behind them. They had, uh, you know, organizations voting to endorse that initiative, which was, of course, far more conservative than the Colorado initiative. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a, a more, um, we, we had a tougher initiative to pass and no institutional support, or almost none. We had a handful of elected officials who endorsed us, uh, Jonathan Singer, for example, out of Colorado. Uh, but for the most part, we had, you know, the mayor and the governor hosting press conferences with the business community and the travel community, um, talking about what an absolute uh, devastation Amendment 64 would be on our state. Um, and so we had to do a lot of work in order to combat um, the the misperceptions um, and you know ridiculousness that was coming from the opposition. One of the tough things about running one of these campaigns, from a messaging yeah. perspective, is that prohibitionists get to call upon uh, these ingrained ideas that people have about drugs and drug users. In this case, marijuana and marijuana users. Um, you know, we've all been subjected to so much. Um, you know, public education and the D.A.R.E. program and the rest of it that, tell, that evokes these, like, emotional reactions in us. And it's very difficult to overcome that with facts and data, you know, and <laughs> say, so, well, okay, I know that you think that, you, you know, all of these things are true, but look at this evidence over here. That's not how people tend to, to think. Um, so we had to do a ton of work around, um, you know, just reinforcing these notions that in fact, uh, you know, we can regulate marijuana safely. We can, uh, create a, a better Colorado through amendment 64 and here are the ways that we're going to do it. All the while we have, you know, these elected officials and, members of the treatment community and so many others screaming at the top of their lungs about how, you know, Colorado is going to fall apart and employ, you know, employers will leave and uh, nobody's ever going to come to Colorado. Now, of course, at this point, we know much better uh, than that. Tourism is up, but new businesses are starting. Um, Colorado is doing exceptionally well economically and socially. Anyway, uh, so, you know, we, we worked really hard to reinforce those ideas um, and we had an amazing group of volunteers on the ground who were out there, uh, talking to folks who they knew. And this is a really interesting thing. You know, in Colorado, we encouraged, uh, campaign supporters to talk it up. That was the name of the campaign, the talk it up campaign. So we released videos, we sent out emails, we, we communicated with people over and over and over again. Hey, it's 4th of July. You're going to a barbecue. People are, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to talk about uh, marijuana, you know, inject this idea into the conversation about marijuana being safer than alcohol. Um, hey, it's Thanksgiving, you know, or maybe not Thanksgiving, but uh, Mother's Day. For Mother's Day and Father's Day, we released videos where we had, you know, uh, the image was a, a young woman saying, Mom, I want to talk to you about marijuana and why I prefer it over alcohol. Um, our very first billboard was of a, a woman in her 40s or 50s um, that simply said, um, I prefer marijuana over alcohol. Does that make me a bad person? So it was really about this idea of identifying marijuana users in communities and saying, listen, these are people you know. They know that marijuana is safer than alcohol. Does, do you think that they should be locked up for it or should they be, should we enact some laws that will help benefit our state, um, you know, when it comes to how people go about getting their cannabis, or should we continue to put them in danger? Uh, and, and that shift uh, in thinking, I think, was, was tremendously important to reinforce. Amazing. Uh, so we knocked on a lot of doors. We put out a bunch of ads. Mason Tavert is an absolute genius when it comes to earned media and uh, those kinds of stunts and watching uh, Mason and Steve work together on those pieces 
along with Brian, was always a lot of fun. Uh, no, it, it does. I mean, it sounds uh, like it was an amazing time, and we know that it uh, it, it absolutely was. And uh, to be on the ground and, and then to have the success, it sounds like you guys counted as it as a success uh, even before uh, you did win, and no one counted uh, on winning until you know after it was announced that uh, that it had passed. Is that right? Is that about right? You know, I think towards the end of the campaign, we were really hopeful. We thought, of course, you can never, ever, I don't care how far ahead you are in the polls, you can never count on the idea that you're going to win. You have to keep up that pace and uh, up until the, the polls close. And on election day at 7 p.m., we hung up our, our very last calls. I remember sitting in... Uh, in in the the peace room, as we called it, not the war room, uh, and uh, you know, working on actually making phone calls up until like six fifty five, practically, um, and and we had volunteers in all day. We were out there waving signs, you know, and, and the, there is never a moment until the polls close that you can relax when it comes to an election. But in the last handful of weeks of the campaign, I think you know. For the most part, we were feeling like there was a really good chance that we were going to win this thing. Uh, I didn't write a speech um, it, that addressed the possibility that we were going to lose because I didn't. I, I didn't think that I would need to. And our friend Perry Rosenstein, who uh, came out to work on the campaign with us from California, he had been working on Prop 19 and really active um, in helping with developing our online assets. Um, Harry uh, looked at me one day and he said, you know we're going to win by 55%, right? I was like, Perry, you're out of your mind. Well, he was right. <laughs> we won by 55%. And he told me that a couple of weeks before the election ended. So, you know, there's there's so much more to, to talk about there, but, uh, you know, we only have the time that we have. And so, you know, I do want to kind of um, ask you uh, our two final questions that we ask everyone. Um, and for you, it'll be difficult to, uh, to answer them separately, I'm sure, but uh, let's take a crack at it. The first question is, what has surprised you most in cannabis? The second question is, what has most surprised you in life? And considering who you are and what you do, it might be diff difficult to, to separate the two, but give it a shot. Uh, first off, what has most surprised you in cannabis? Oh, wow, that's such a big question. Um... You know, I think the thing that's most surprised me in cannabis is the people. Um, some of the people who are most important in my life have come to me through that world. Um, some of my dearest friends and, and folks that, you know, I mean, when, uh, when, when we were all kind of, you know, <laughs> in the trenches together in 2009 and 2010, um, you know, after uh, one of the businesses I worked for was raided by the DEA, like the, the, the people who were there then are here now um, and are, are the people who I turn to most frequently, folks like Jill Lamoureux, um, you know, and... and Chris Crane, uh, Troy Dayton, and, and Chris Lotlicker, who are, you know, my, some of my most, those people are some of my most uh, valued advisors and mentors. And, um, and I wouldn't have necessarily expected that, um, but I'm incredibly grateful for it. Yeah. And, and can you then uh, answer what uh, has most surprised you in, in life? Uh, because that, that was kind of that answer too, right? Well, I mean, really, like, I kind of wake up every day shocked that I'm the executive director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, that I was the spokesperson for the Amendment 64 campaign, that I spent 2013 working for the National Cannabis Industry Association as the deputy director. Uh, shaping the 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 conversation, the national dialogue around banking and and access for can you know and, uh, and and cannabis business in America, like as as everyone is talking about it, um, that any of those things happened to me, 
is just stunning. I don't, I, I still don't understand it. <laughs> but, but again, very grateful. <laughs> Well, these are the mysteries of life, Betty. And uh, listen, we really appreciate uh, your time. We know how busy you are, but uh, your voice needed to be added to this uh, conversation. We're uh, happy to continue it down the line. You know, hopefully you'll have uh, some more time to do a, a part two uh, sometime soon. Uh, but for this morning, uh, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Seth. And uh, I really had a great time on the podcast. I'm, I'm enjoying listening to the episodes and I appreciate that there's somebody out there making this audio history of the work that we're doing. It's wonderful. Excellent. All right. Thanks. An important voice for us in the legal cannabis industry. It's so interesting to hear how much uh, the industry is utilizing folks that are coming through SSDP and uh, how many of them there are. So, as jobs and uh, availability opens up within the space, it's good to know that there's a farm system that's being run by the Betty Aldworth. 